guys. Uh, I'm Baba Goris. Uh, hashtag B A B A K G O L R I Z on Twitter. I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Thank you, Baba Joe. All right, my name is uh, Pasha Jian. I'm yeah, just a big fan of Team Medi. You can find me on Twitter at p a s h zero twenty one, and I'll just um, and just now give it to Cena. Hello, guys. I'm uh, I'm Cena. Um, you can find me at, on Twitter at um, s i n a a underscore s a, and I'm uh, really happy to speak to you guys. Cheers, guys. Well, for, for first thing, we just want to go off the bat. Um, one thing I do want to say is that we want to first preview with the Iran versus Nigeria game, and I just want your opinion. So I'm going to give this first to Bobak. So Bobak, what did you think about of our performance? Uh, thanks, Pasha. Uh, I think uh, all in all, if we want to review the games independently of each other, I thought it was a good performance against Nigeria, considering the sort of uh, warm-ups that we had, lack of international experience against top opposition. I would probably say Nigeria is uh, one of the best national teams we've played in the last 10 years. So uh, the start worried me a little bit, the first 15 minutes, and I was worried we'd concede a goal. But uh, we grew into the game, and I'd say from about the half an hour mark until the 60th or 65th minute, we were on top in terms of... uh, comfort or uh, stability on the pitch and we created a few half chances we didn't take them but uh, towards the end of the day the nigerians were frustrated physically they didn't look they didn't look to the standards we thought they would and iran really surpassed all expectations in terms of fitness and discipline kurosh has done a fantastic job Uh, fitness and discipline were the two points that we've always lacked in and and, uh, he really has instilled a lot of those into the team. Overall, I thought it was a, a decent performance and a good point at the end of the match. Perfect, Bobak. Thank you. Sina, would you like to anything add on to that or do you agree with Bobak? Sina? Sina? Um, well, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, I agree with him. I think, uh, I think it was a, defensively it was a great performance. I mean, to be honest, we all agree that the priority will be, you know, keeping things tight at the back, and uh, we did it perfectly. Nigeria really looked, you know, uninspiring in midfield. They couldn't create anything, and we forced them to to go through the middle. And you know, they're not a team that plays through the middle. They like they like to go through, uh, you know, their right and left wingers, and they, they weren't able to do that. So uh, yeah, we frustrated them, and um, I think you know we could have gone a little bit more offensive. In the last 25, 20, 25 minutes, but in the end, as I said, you know, the priority was um, to at least get one point to get to keep things tight at the back, and uh, we did it perfectly. Exactly. You know, personally, I agree with both of you guys. You know, just to play that well against African champions itself speaks for itself. Um, but one thing that I was really surprised was the performance of Hagidi, because you know there was a lot of debate of now who's going to be in goal, and I think he did a phenomenal job. And what did you think of it, Babak? What do you think about Hagi's performance? I think he was solid. Uh, I don't know if he was tested that much against Nigeria, but he seemed capable except for uh, very early on when there was a cross which he flapped at, and I think we were lucky to get a free kick for that. But generally, he seems solid and composed. Uh, he's not a spectacular goalkeeper, but he seems to have good positioning and... Uh, he, he knows uh, he's got good reflexes, but his kicking uh, can improve a lot as well. But generally, I'd say uh, it was a position that while we were worried about, he has done a good job. Zach, Sina, so, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, listen, goalkeeper is a, is a fascinating position because, you know, even though he hasn't got that many games, uh, you know, in the past a year or so, but it's not about match fitness when it comes to goalkeepers. Whereas, you know, out of your play, it's all about match fitness, you know, being shot. With goalkeepers, goalkeepers, you know, playing games, it gives them confidence in the sense that they'll, you know, they'll make the right decisions. And he did look a little bit shaky at the beginning of the game, as Bobak said. And I think that was, pure, that was purely to the fact that he hasn't played that much football in the past two years. But as the game went on, he got more confident. He, got, he started making his, uh, you know, being more decisive, making the right decisions. And you know he was nearly caught out for the free kick as well. Uh, the one uh, I think I'm not. I think it was Ahmed Musa who took it, and he just crept in on the left hand side, and uh, he he did well to uh, to get to it. 
But you no, know, as as the game went on, he started to settle into the game and he looked really solid. He's like, you know, he had a pretty solid performance. But one thing that really caught my attention online after the finish, when the match finished, I saw before the game uh, started, we see Dawberry and Hadley give e giving each other, like, a big hug. Like, they give, like, comforting each other. And she's like, good luck and stuff. And I think that that was a really symbolic thing for our national team with what has happened with Mehdi Rahmati when she was really upset about, you know, that why Daniel Dawberry is coming in the team. And that's something that was really special for Hadley and Dawberry in that moment and even for our own national team. But one yeah, thing, I think, yeah, go on, Tino, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, of course the players uh, deserve a lot of credit, but I think Kairos deserves even more credit for creating the atmosphere within the team. You know, a real togetherness, which I think we lacked in 2006. I mean, Babak would definitely agree with me on this. We lacked that togetherness, togetherness in 2006, but I think in this one, we have that togetherness, we have that team spirit, and I think that, that was shown perfectly by the example that, you know, you just brought up. Mm, yeah, I completely agree with you, Sina. I don't think we've ever had a team spirit or camaraderie as we have right now. And some of the selections which uh, people criticized before the tournament, I think we can put a lot of them down to team spirit and what's best for the squad. Sometimes it's better to have a certain player sitting on the bench than another player. And uh, the players, when you look at them, they don't seem to have too many egos in that squad. They seem to get along. There's a bit of friendship between them and... During my lifetime of following Tim Melly, I don't remember ever having some sort of uh, healthy uh, training camp or, or squad uh, squad mood as we have right now. You, know, you guys bring up a great thing about team spirit, and one thing I would like to add to that. Do you think it's, you know, at first sight when Dawberry was playing, like when joining Tim Melly, it seemed like he would just hang out, you know, with the typical people. They just speak English with Beitoshu, they just seem he's like his buddy. But now I feel like he feels more at ease, you know, he talks to, I feel like he talks to everyone. He's learning more about the Iranian culture more. Do you think that it has all to do with Kadosh himself or just himself has lit up? Like he feels more comfortable now. Well, I think that uh, it's the fact that when you, you live and sleep and drink and eat together for one month, you're going to become like a sort of like a second family. And yeah. it's difficult to say whether it's Kairosh who's uh, affected this or it's Dalbari himself or it's the other players. I think it's a combination of everything. But the fact that the team seems to be very receptive, they're not, uh, they don't have egos, there's no jealousy. Everyone seems to be backing each other up. So that's good for us. And I really do hope that no matter what happens, happens uh, in the rest of the World Cup for us, uh, we somehow maintain this sort of team spirit. Uh, that's very important. Well said, Baba. Do you, anything else would you like to add to that, Sino? No, I, I agree, as I asked. Well, one thing that you know, surprises I mean, me was well, that, you know, you can, yeah, go on. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can see in the way we play on the pitch that every player is playing, not just for themselves, not just for their country, but for, for their teammates, the way they work yeah. hard. They're, they're working for each other, they're playing for each other, and I think that's uh, that's a really key point, not just for us, but for any team going into the World Cup and hoping. Exactly. Well, another yeah. point I want to bring on about, you know, I think you both would agree that predominantly we thought our left back starter was going to be Bakes out there, you know, but because he got injured during the Austrian camp, I was pretty surprised to see Merta Puladi starting, to be honest with you, but he had a phenomenal, brilliant performance was in the top 10 list of uh, first week of players that performed really well, right behind Thomas Muller. So what do you guys think about his performance? Bobak? Sorry, uh, sorry, Pasha. Could you repeat that uh, for the first part of your question? Yeah, so I was saying Mehrdad Puladi was, he did yeah. phenomenal, you know, because okay, even okay. he's our he's our left back, you know, he's yeah. our left back starter now, and Bakes that it should have been our starter, predominantly at first. But what do you think about his performance? Yeah, I think he. If, uh, if we saw the Castro rankings, he was the number exactly. one rated defender, and he was number two overall. But forgetting about ratings and performances and uh, numbers, he was uh, spectacular, especially in the last fifteen minutes of the game when uh, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't begrudge anyone with tired minds or tired legs. At that point, he really went in. He looked as fit as ever. He cleared the ball off the line a couple of times with two headed clearances. There was a point uh, towards our left side in defense where he muscled off the Nigerian winger off the ball and uh, generally speaking he was very solid I didn't expect him to uh, to play at that level but again it's it's a symbol symbolism of the fact that overall as a unit we are playing well it, there's no it, it, it's not just about Puladi making a tackle it's about the guy that 
backs him up behind him, who's covered him as well. It's about the guy in front of him who can make the second run to block the second ball. So it's as a unit, we've played well, and it's made everyone look even better than they are. Definitely agree with that. Tino, would you like to add anything on that, mate? Yeah, listen, I think he, in the friendlies as well before the World Cup, he looked a little shaky. I mean, you start to doubt whether he was even going to start and whether Kouros should, should uh, you know, try to play our right-backs like Mahini or Beto should try him at left-back and see if it works or not. But listen, the guy was phenomenal. I think he was fantastic. He's been one of the biggest surprises in the yeah. uh, World Cup. Campaign. With all these injuries he's had. Yeah, exactly. Listen, I've been watching him for a few years and... I've, I've never seen that side of him. He works so hard, and you can see the determination in his face. He kept running, he kept running. He was, he was fantastic, honestly. And again, that symbolizes the the, t- the togetherness and the determination of the squad, as Barak pointed out before as well. Yeah, well said, you know. So one thing, one player that caught my attention, which I think he ran the most, but really he didn't do anything, was Hoser Heydari. So I'm going to give this to you, Sina, first. So what do you think? What do you think about his performance, honestly? Hoser Heydari. Well, of course, I think um, Heider, first of all, he played, you know, played in that right winger spot because we needed um, protection right. for full back positions. He didn't, he didn't really add anything to the offensive side of the game. I mean, we saw a few times that he tried to go forward, but physically and and uh, you know, he didn't physically. He wasn't good enough, and he didn't really have the pace to uh, to really trouble the uh, Nigerian left back. Again, I was surprised that he ran so much, I and mean, when I saw the stats afterwards. But then again, I think that was the reason why he played. He he, he, pro- he provided a lot of uh, protection for Montazeri. I mean, mm-hmm. in the beginning of the game, Montazeri looked a little bit shaky. There was a moment when uh, Victor Moses went past him and put in a cross, which again Pula declared. But as the game went on, you know, they both started to settle in, and I think Heder did uh, did well for most of the game in the sense that in the defensive uh, sense of the game, not going forward. I, I thought he was clueless when he was going forward. He had the uh, you know no ability of troubling the Nigerian defense whatsoever. But compared to our other players, would you would you still think he was really effective even though he ran that much? Well, listen, he was, as I said, you know, he was all about, um, you know, having the work rate and yeah. the work ethic to uh, to make sure Nigeria doesn't get anywhere going forward. And he did that, you know, of course, if you've got runners in your team, even if they don't do anything with the ball, you're still uh, kind of hassling the uh, the Nigerian players on the ball. Definitely. So, so yeah, he did well in that sense. But as I said, you know, going forward, he he, had, he gave us nothing. Awesome. Bob John, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I think uh, Kirosh wanted to make sure that we have a very settled and solid uh, side in the first game. Uh, retrospect is a very uh, valuable uh, commodity in life, which we don't have. And at the end of the first game, I would have said, yes, it was a good choice. The selection was right. The performance was good. But now looking back after some days have passed and some other events have taken place, I would say, hmm, maybe it would have been better if Shojai started that game as well, because uh, we'll talk about it later, but uh, yeah, it could definitely. have had more of an impact. Uh, hey, Derry, I thought was solid. He did run around. Uh, his positioning was decent. He helped out Montezeri, but I'm not sure he really influenced the game. Not necessarily even going forward, but even in the defensive phase, he he, he was positioning himself in the right places. He probably did what uh, Kerosh wanted from him. And maybe looking back, even Carlos Kerosh would probably say, you know what, if this was the second game or this was the Argentina in the first game or some circumstances were slightly different he may have not started with Heydari definitely but what about, don't, you, don't you think it was because of that solid performance in the game against Nigeria and the fact that we managed to get one point it, then he gave Kairosh a bit more freedom in the fact that you know he could give it a go against Argentina and not worry about the fact that if we lose against Nigeria against Argentina we could possibly be out of the competition it's possible that that could be it or it could also be the fact that uh, he looked at it and said you know what we didn't influence the game going forward as much as I would have liked and maybe having Hodge Safi and Heyderi in midfield is one too many so uh, it, it's probably a combination of reasons you know it's difficult to pinpoint one but uh, I don't think we should be complaining or we, we, we have much grounds to complain overall I agree with both of you guys. So, you know, we talked about Heyderi, and our right back was Montazeri, and bloody hell, we were all scared that he's gonna probably going to be messing up or he's going to be just passing easily. But I was really shell-shocked of how he he, did, he had a solid performance. And, Sina, what do you think about his performance, honestly? Page one of Montazeri. Um, as I said before, you know, he looked a little bit shaky at the beginning of the game. I mean, 
and uh, I was a little bit scared there because Moses went past him a few times easily and as did um, Ahmed Musa. But I think, again, it, as the game went on, just like the rest of the team, he started to settle into the game. He started getting his positioning right. You, know, the, the, you could see the Nigeria's manager as well, you know, getting frustrated when uh, he, he had to take off Victor Moses because he didn't really have the same effect as the game went on. He, could, he didn't really trouble uh, Montezari. So I think, you know, again, as the game went on, he settled into the game and, and he did what he was uh, he was told to do. Physically as well, he you know he provided a lot of uh, strength for us in the, in that right right side of our defence. Exactly. Go on, Baba. You got any uh, thoughts? Uh, not just Montezari, but uh, Hosseini, Sadir, the uh, pretty much the whole back line and the goalkeeper. They were fantastic. The defenders yeah. were fantastic. The only thing that makes me feel a little bit sad is that they're all, other than Puladi, on the wrong side of thirty. And based on their performances at the World Cup, you know, scouts would be definitely interested in their uh, defense uh, in our defensive players but unfortunately they're all on the wrong side of 30 and they will not get the opportunity i hope that this spurs on the younger players in our squad and outside our squad to take a chance to move to european football at an earlier age when even if the money isn't as good or even if the distance is too much or even if it's not the best team in the best league it, it, it makes a huge difference we've seen it with Ali Reza Jahan Bakhsh we've seen it with players like uh, Ashkan Dejava and others who have grown up in European football. You can see the difference when it comes to the tactical side, the mental side, the discipline side. It's just uh, football from a different planet. And that's the main ingredient that's missing in Iranian football, which Kirosh has added to this team on a temporary short-term basis. What happens after he's gone, we will we'll wait and see. But we'll definitely we discuss can... about that too. Yeah. Sina, so, you know, anything would you like to add to that? You know what, that, that question is I've been wondering about that for uh, for a few weeks. That what yeah. will we do once Kerish is gone? I mean, we we all know this is a temporary side because we you know we can't go into the Asian Cup or even further. You're just playing a defensive game. So where do we go from here? But you know that's a question that we have to leave until after the World Cup and uh, and see what happens. But I think he's he's got us really organised, really solid, and uh, you know he deserves a lot of respect and uh, and appreciation. Exactly. You know, he left. Uh, he left Iran. If he's probably he's he's definitely leaving Iran, and he's probably he said it publicly too. And he left the foundation for our national team. And I hope, I hope somehow we build on upon that. We don't get somebody random, and he has a different set of philosophies. You know, or he just doesn't prefer. You know, he just prefers home local players, and not you know the likes of Deja Gaia, Reza Gucinic, because they're foreign to them. And that was a lot of debated. But before we get to that issue, we'll talk about that later. One thing I do want to ask you guys, and I'm going to give it to you again, Sina, is what could we have done differently to beat Nigeria? Well, our substitutions could have uh, you know, could have been made a lot earlier. I would have liked to see um, Jahan Bash coming on earlier in the game, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. I mean, Nigerians looked, um, I think as the game went on, they looked uh, really tired and frustrated, and they started creating even less and less as the game went on. So I think we could have gone a little bit more offensive. Um, from the 60th minute onwards, I mean, I even would have liked to see. Uh, I'm sorry for coming on, but uh, yeah, I think that was the uh, that was the only thing I would have changed because uh, listen, the priority, as we've been saying uh, many times, was to get at least one point to to make sure we are solid at the back, and uh, that was a priority. Everything else would uh, would have been a bonus, I would say. Okay, Bob back. I think uh, Sina's headed straight on the nail and uh, straight on the head and uh, probably from the 60th minute we could have made some changes because we started to push forward, we started to throw more men forward but the men that were going forward were not the people that naturally know how to deal with that sort of situation on the offensive phase. Uh, hey Daddy, hi Safi, these are defensive players by nature. So if you had someone like Masu Chojai or uh, Ali Reza Jahan Baksh on the ball in those situations, there's a chance that things would have been different. So I don't think the approach should have changed, but I think a couple of substitutions could have happened a little bit earlier. Uh, and who knows, we may have stolen a, a goal and won that game. But overall, I thought Nigeria was very disappointing and generally were very comfortable and uh, they were very one-dimensional and they didn't have enough creativity to go through our lines. So uh, I didn't expect much from them for the rest of the World Cup. But uh, as we know, they've got a chance now. Yeah. You know, yeah, I yeah. go on, Tino. I think... I think uh, we as a team did our homework on Nigeria. I don't think they did their homework on us. 
because we knew they were going to come from wide areas and we protected the wide areas and we pushed them to go through the middle and they had nothing. But I don't think they really did their homework and tried to, you know, they didn't even try to break us down. I mean, they, they looked, as I say, you know, really uninspiring, the lack of creativity in midfield and the Nigerian manager, Stephen Keshi, came under a lot of pressure for the team's performance, not necessarily because of the result, but because of the because of their really, really poor performances, Bob I just said as well. Exactly. So, any comments on the substitutions? Like, what would you guys, who would you guys prefer to see Kairos would have put in as opposed to, you know, Jaron Bash or any other player? I'm going to give this to uh, Bob, I go first. I think, uh, like we said already, uh, Jahan Bach, uh, Shojai, and Ansari Fat, these are pretty much the only offensive uh, rolls of the dice that we had on the bench and we have on the bench. So I would have, I would have in that game, I would have liked to have seen Jahan Bach about 15 minutes earlier and uh, would have put in Ansari Fat instead of uh, Reza um, towards the end because Reza had ran his legs into the ground. So I would have probably made those two changes, but... Uh, uh, it's not to be. Yeah. Sina? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Jahan Bash should have came a lot earlier because Nigeria looked a little bit tired, uh, you know, from the 65th minute onwards. And we could have taken advantage of that from uh, from the pace of uh, Jahan Bash or even the technical ability. Exactly, guys. Well, I was happy with the result. I think nil nil was the perfect thing to go off with. Go on, Sina. Would you like to add anything to that? I, didn't hear that, I was just gonna talk about that. I was happy with the result, and uh, I think that was like the perfect way to start out our campaign. And even though we still could have had a chance to win, but I honestly think that just to have a nil nil and just get a one point off of the African champions was was predominantly a great great thing for our nation. Anything? Well, any comments? Listen, the positives out of that game just completely outweigh the negatives. I mean, yeah, this this was our first point from the first game, you know, ever in the World Cup. I mean, what? That, that is just, I think, brilliant from a side that probably isn't the best team we've ever had at the World Cup, you know, individually. But uh, that's a great achievement, first clean sheet of the World Cup. But so, you know, it gave us a chance, uh, in the, you know, in the upcoming games against Argentina and uh, Bosnia. So I think, you know, the positives completely outweigh the negatives. Exactly. Bob, back. Yeah, I agree. Uh, before the game, if they told us you can take a point, we would have taken it. Uh, after the fifth minute of the game, I was uh, part of me saying hit the final whistle right now. So considering that, uh, we shouldn't be too greedy and have uh, asked for more, expected more. I think our performance deserved one point and not more than that. And it gave us a platform for the rest of the World Cup. So I think, uh, I think all in all, it was a good performance and a good result. Awesome. So now we want to go on to the topic of Iran versus Argentina, which I could say that you guys would both agree, and I bet you 80 other Iran, 80 million other Irans would agree, that it was, a nation, it was a game that made our nation proud. But one thing before we get to that, one thing I do want to ask you, Bobek, is that, you know, we saw Haydari get dropped and Shodri started. Like, what were your opinions before the match started? Were you happy? Were you not happy? I was definitely happy. I thought that uh, the fact that we had one point in the bag allowed Kirush to, let's say, unshackle some of the chains. And that's the reason why Masri Choje started. I thought uh, the lineup was more or less the, the right choice, the right selection, the most experienced team out there, probably. Uh, I thought Masri Choje was fantastic, especially in the second half. Uh, he did a good job for the team on the first half. But second half, he was driving all our counterattacks. He was great on the ball. Uh, his dribbling was on par, uh, on par with his best again. He was uh, distributing the ball well, and he was getting Montezeri into the field. He was uh, getting uh, Dejava into the field as well. Uh, overall, I thought it was a good, 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 probably one of the best three performances I've ever seen from Team Merli, up there with uh, beating Korea 6-2 and uh, beating the US 2-1. Yeah. Uh, desperately unlucky. I really thought uh, we exceeded all expectations, not just in terms of the, I mean, the result we fell short at the end, but the performance and taking the game to Argentina in the second half, there was a 10 or 15 minute period where we were having them on the back foot. They were shocked. They were scared. Uh, we had about 70 or 80% of the ball for that those few minutes. And we were just unlucky not to get a goal at that time. And what, what can you say when you're up against the best player in the world, uh, uh, he's gonna he's gonna get a one little sniff from a half chance and he's gonna put it away. Exactly, Bobak. So Bobak, one thing I do, one thing that you pointed about 
you know, about the way we've played. But one thing I do want to ask you is that, what would you think? Wouldn't you, I was? I would have thought that you know that he would have at least put a Shujai in the last game in Nigeria and put a plays Heydari. Were you surprised he didn't do that? I think it's about the order of the games. Maybe mm -hmm. out of context, I would say yes, you're right. But the order of the games, the fact that we took one point in the first game, he was always going to be more cautious in the first game, no matter who we played against. Correct. In the second game, the fact that we had a result allowed him to be a little bit more adventurous, knowing that, you know what, we'll give it a go. Even if we don't get the result, we still have a chance in the last game. So I'm not really surprised. I thought uh, it was the right lineup uh, and the right setup and he showed that uh, after the first game a lot of people thought oh that's the most boring game in the world cup <laughs> iran is a defensive team yeah. we agreed i mean i i said all right you know what that's our limitation we've got to play this way we want to win it's about winning it's not about pleasing uh, hundreds of millions of neutrals who want exactly. to enjoy one and a half hours of a game we want to get results we want to go forward so i thought we showed that we can also play football and we took the game to one of the best teams in the world even though they haven't shown it in the world cup definitely see now yeah listen i don't think uh, i mean please disagree with me if, uh, if you think i'm wrong but i don't yeah. think there was any doubt over whether Hadery was going to play in the first game or not i think everyone knew he was going to play the yeah. surprising bit was whether Hartsafi would start instead of Masood or not. And that was a surprising bit. I don't think there was any doubt whatsoever whether Hader was going to play or not. Especially because in our defence, possibly the weakest point is our right spot because we play in the centre back there. So we, he did need protection. And the only one yeah. who could provide it was Hader. So he would have definitely played and I would have definitely started him even if, you know, even if we go back in time and try and change it. But, you know, as I said, the, the result was a, was a good result. The performance was a good performance. And... Listen, this is a competition, you know, it's not an entertainment. It's all about getting exactly. results and it's all about making the most out of what you have. And the, and the way we do that is with our defensive game and try and, uh, you know, stay solid at the back and hit teams on the counter, which a lot of teams have been doing so far in, the, in this World Cup. The, you know, most of the teams that play counter-attacking game have been coming out as winners and, get, you know, getting the most points. I mean, obviously we play a more defensive game, but that's the way we play, that's the way we get points. Exactly. Great point. So one thing I do want to ask you guys is that you know, you know, even though we, even though we, even though yes, you know, Argentina had the mobile position, but that doesn't really matter. We had we had the most chances, and a lot of them we got unlucky with. But one thing that that uh, that foul basically, which was a clear call penalty, Zabaleta on Deja. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what are your things? Go, Sino. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Um, yeah. No matter how many years I live, I'll never forget it because it was an appalling decision. It was pathetic. I mean, how can you, how how is that not a penalty? I mean, if if right, he gave a goal kick, right? So if it was a goal kick, then that means Deja got touched the ball. Exactly. So Zabaleta hasn't pushed it. So how is that not a penalty then? I mean, if Zabaleta did get not the even ball, a corner he kick, you didn't even give him the corner kick. Exactly. I mean, thinking I think the referee was absolutely atrocious I mean th there was times where he just kept getting into the middle of the game he kept hitting the ball I mean come on this is the World Cup it's not a club it's not club football that you can say well decisions um, even themselves are in the course of the season the hearts of millions of people are with that team when they play it and you need your best referees you need to, you need them to get the, the clear ones right if it was the 50-50, if it was the close one, then that's a different situation. But when it's as clear as that, when it's a stonewall penalty, you need the decisions to go your way. Exactly. Bye back. Yeah, I, I was I was shocked. Uh, I was even more shocked when I saw the replay because initially I thought, yes, it's a penalty, but it could be a 50-50 call. But when I saw the replay, it was a dead certain call. The referee was poor. He got into the uh, he got involved in the play a couple of times. Like Sina said, every 50-50 went Argentina's way. Uh, penalty there that could have changed the whole game, could have won that game. But uh, what I remember was the referee was the same referee who sent off Pepe and didn't give a penalty to Portugal. He had a iffy game for Portugal against Germany as well. So I'm not sure why he was given a second game so quickly. It's just uh, the quality of refereeing has been very poor in the World Cup and largely against the smaller teams. Costa Rica have overcome it, but that's because they're a fantastic side that has really outplayed all their opponents. Otherwise, the smaller teams like us, uh, 
when a decision goes against us or doesn't go for us, it's difficult to overcome that. You know, it's difficult to create another opportunity that can compensate for that. So it's obviously going to be the bigger nations like Brazil, Argentina. They're going to get the decisions their way. That's the way. That's the way it's always been, and that's the way it's always going to be. Unfortunately. Exactly. So if 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 Zabaleta did that on Neymar. I would definitely say, not trying to be biased or anything, I would definitely say the ref would have given a stonewall penalty. That's a penalty. Would you guys agree with that? Definitely. Yeah, listen. You could, you, you know, some people could make a case for the referee saying, well, from his position, it didn't look like a penalty. What were the linesman? You know, yeah, exactly. That's a great he's, point. He's great right point. It's right, right in his, you know, sight. I mean, how can you miss that? He didn't get the ball. He got the man. That's a definite penalty. I mean... I'd be surprised if anyone can come up with a valid, uh, you know, reason to why that wasn't a penalty. Exactly. So, Bobby, would you like to say anything about the linesman? Why he didn't do anything about it? Just stood there. Nah, uh, linesman could argue that it's <laughs> about 35, 40, 35 meters away at the opposite end of the penalty box. But uh, overall, between the two of them, they have to get a result. There's no one obstructing their view because it was just a one-on-one uh, Dejaga and uh, Zabaleta. There's no one behind them. There's no one on the side. So no excuses, just poor refereeing. And I hope the, referee, the refereeing team doesn't get uh, another opportunity at this World Cup. One thing that I knew for a fact that this that this whole tournament was gonna be poor officiating. I don't know if you guys remember or watched the game. The first game, home game, Brazil versus Croatia. That that pen that dive basically from Fred, which was that should have been a yellow, not even a penalty. Since that point, when Oshimar whoever gave the penalty, just from since that point on, I just knew that the refs are gonna be very very awful. And that just really, if you're gonna give a penalty for what Fred did, would that like dive basically a Sergio Busquets kind of dive? And you don't give a stonewall penalty to a team that has given it at all. That just says it all for me. And I think that is very, very poor. I think, personally, we're in an era of uh, professional football with uh, scrutiny, media scrutiny, uh, l- large contracts, TV audiences, uh, replays, goal line technology. It's about time that referees get to be uh, measured by the same standards everyone else is. If a referee makes a mistake, there should be a review after the game and the guy should be banned or dropped or whatever. Nothing. If a player makes a dive and it's clear, there should be something after the game, rep- retrospective action. The name uh, Fred should have been banned. If something happens that's not fair during the game, they should deal with it after the game. No one has even mentioned Fred's dive afterwards. Why? Exactly. Because Fred plays yeah. for Brazil. Fred yeah. plays for a big team. But if it was the other way around, the small player, small team, etc., the bands are very easy to be uh, quickly uh, to be dished out, and it's it's not right. So I think that generally refereeing and retrospective action should should be uh, refereeing should be. Uh, uh, under the microscope after the games and retrospective action against players who cheat should also take place. Okay. Sina, you got anything on the officiating side? Listen, I, th- I don't think there is uh, anything else to comment <laughs> I mean, it's, Listen, it's been poor in every game. Yeah. Mexico, Mexico has got two goals in the, in the second game of the World Cup. Yeah, the first half. Yeah, yeah offsides. Yeah, yeah. Offsides on Dos Santos. And wasn't even close. You know, he wasn't even close offsides. And you know the game, Bosnia's game last night as well, which we will come on to. Yeah, we we'll definitely do. It's been a, it's, it's been a theme of this World Cup, the poor officiating, and you know, listen, it's it's just as I said, you know, if it's a fifty-fifty, if, if it's a close one, then you can give a bit of sympathy to the referee saying, well, you know, he could he could have gone the other way, but I mean, you expect him to get the clear ones, right? I mean, you expect him to get penalties and the clear ones, clear decisions, uh, right? But. What can you say? You know, if, if it was in our hands, then it would have been changed a very long time ago. Okay. Hypothetically, let's say we didn't make it. But this game, this this penalty that we should we should have, the ref should have given us, when the, when the tournament ends for us, it's going to come down to what if, what if he did give us. And that's going to hurt a lot of us deep down. Because if that call was made, you know, I didn't, I, I really wanted when this tournament to end that, okay, Iran played well, okay, they didn't deserve it. But the thing that hurts most is that it's those kind of things that it's what if, what if we did this, what if, if we, if Messi didn't score that goal, what would have happened? And that hurts a lot. That hurts a lot. Uh, I agree with you, but the idea is that we have another chance. We have the opportunity. Yeah. It's still... I mean, it's not completely in our hands, but we still have a chance. Life is all about these what ifs. We yeah. can't we can't dwell on these moments right now. We need to look forward to the final game against Bosnia, put in our best performance, try to get three points, and then just pray that it's enough to qualify. Uh, there's nothing else to be said about it. Thank you, Sina. Would you like anything to say about that? Well, 
But listen, that would have been a different situation because then we had nothing to, to complain about. But when it's when it's when it comes to down to something like this, it's, it's always hard to take. And so you know. Hello. Change is just how the I think it's just our uh, uh, determination has actually increased to go into that Bosnia game and get the three points and uh, hope for the other results to go our way. Yeah, thank you. Well, now you know. Now I want to change the topic a little bit and then think about our own individual players. For me, I personally think Hagley was the best player for Iran. You know, basically his second start ever, and I think anything. I think I think he did phenomenal. He was dominating that box. And do you guys agree? Do you guys think he's a new eagle of Asia, Ogabasia, Babak? Uh, let's not get carried away. Uh, <laughs> I think he's been good. I don't think he's been uh, he's done anything spectacular. He's been solid. Let's put it this way. He's yeah. been a safe pair of hands. His positioning is very good. He's got a big physical presence off the crosses. He doesn't seem to catch them, but he punches them quite far away, which is a good point. Uh, he's got a long way to go. I'm I'm hopeful that after the World Cup, once K. Rush is gone. We can give him a chance to grow into this role by giving him the opportunity to continue playing. Otherwise, he plays three games or four games or whatever it is, and then he's discarded by the next manager, yeah. and then you go back to square one. He's got potential. That's what I can say. He's young. He's been in Europe for the last couple of years. Uh, he's worth investing our time and efforts into. Exactly. See you now? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, he, had a, he had a great game, but he looked a little bit shaky on, uh, on corners. I think he... You know, he was unsure whether to come out or stay on his line. He came into, you know, no man's land, as they call it. And he, he could have been caught out, you know, if it wasn't for um, for Argentina's poor finishing on the corners. But, uh, listen, we've given him the chance now. It's up to him to go out there, find a club that he can play, play regular football. Because he hasn't been doing that in the past two years. He's gone, he went to Rubin Kazan on the bench for a year. Then he went back to Paris Police on loan. Again on the bench, and it's just been the past six months that he's gone to Portuguese second division and got regular football. Yeah. So you know he needs he needs to he needs to make the right decision, find the right club, and go there and play regular football and develop himself even more. Because we've you know obviously Kerush has, uh, has talked with him, he's um, he's trusted him, and he's given him the chance to play. Uh, you know, at a, you know there's no bigger stage in the World Cup anyway. So from here onwards, I think it's up to Haji to go out there and uh, and find the right club and play regular football. Definitely. So who was Cena? Now we, I'll keep talking to you. Who was your favorite player? Who is it? Was this Happy Day or is it somebody else that caught your attention? I think uh, there was. A, I don't think there was. There was one man that you can pick out. I think yeah, was, I know. Uh, there was a lot of uh, great performances. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Andranik. He's my yeah. possibly third favorite player of all time. Of, you know, Iranian players. He, and he's my favorite player of this side as well. I mean, he works his socks off. He made some crucial challenges, some great interceptions, not just in the Argentina game against Nigeria as well. And he's been the pick, I think, to be honest. Obviously, Pouladi has been the surprising bear. He's played fantastically well, but oh, come on, you can't, you can't just uh, ignore Andrani. As well as the coach, Andrani, you know, he, obviously his work rate has been, uh, you know, he was kind of uh, known to us anyway, but. You know, he's just brilliant. You know, he keeps running, putting the defense nice. under pressure. He comes back and helps the defense as well. So yeah, I mean, Hosseini as well. He was a he was a great performer. So listen, there was there was a, you know you could point out a lot of players and say they played the they played a great great game because they all did. Yeah, definitely. He had Messi in his back pocket. That's what it was. Ball back. Yeah. Yes, you guys both right. Uh, it's difficult to pick one player that stands out because in a performance like that, everyone plays a role. But yeah, some of the highlights for me were the center backs, obviously Pouladi again, uh, Ando as usual. He gives a ten out of ten performance in terms of effort. Uh, he sometimes compensates for Nekunam's uh, laxidaisical movement on the pitch. I thought Dejaga was a different player compared to the, the one who played the last game. But the same can be said about Gucci, but on the negative terms. I thought. He wasn't as active and mobile as he was in the first game. But I would have to give a special mention to Pejma Montezeri. He was uh, out of this world, especially Definitely. going forward. He was he was the one who was creating those chances for Tejava, Gucci, uh, etc. He was on the right wing and doing what Dani Alves does. So I was very surprised. <laughs> While he was solid in defense, he was really a great offensive outlet yesterday. And I really didn't expect it. Definitely. 
Just not bringing the point about Pedro Montes. Are you going to, you know? I just want to point something out. Baba, do you think um, his ability to go forward was because of the fact that Argentina don't play through wide areas as much as Nigeria did? So he had more, of, you know, more freedom of going forward because Argentina play a narrow game. Do you think, you know, was that the reason? Uh, I, to a degree, yes, even though he was going forward far more in the second half when Argentina kind of spread out their play. But I think it's the fact that there was so much space to run into, it was worth making those marauding runs. Uh, Argentina were pushing forward, they were leaving one or two men at the back, and it had a lot of space for Shurjai, Dejaga, Montezetti to run into. So, yeah, probably to a degree, but uh, the game, the game, the way the game played, up, uh, allowed him the opportunity to go forward, but at that point, that final ball which he was sending in, that was world class uh, three or four times. It was top of the top of the notch uh, uh, ball he was sending in. So he's a he's a centre back playing in the right back position and then sending that sort of final ball, which sometimes Hatsafi lets himself down on the other side when he was going forward. So it's it's just something to applaud. Definitely. So, I want to say one thing that I want to go to another point is that how did you guys feel after that Messi going to the 91st minute ball back? How did you feel? Uh, I was standing at that point uh, in my living room. Yeah. Uh, I kept on sitting, standing, sitting, standing. At that point, I was standing and I was just trying to count down the minutes. And when he scored, I was just. Uh, Better sweet. I had a little. Sm- I had a little smile to myself, like a very sad and cynical yeah. smile, and I just thought to myself, you know what, it's messy. And I felt numb, and then I don't want to tell you what else happened after that, <laughs> but I was very numb, and I just told myself it was messy. Who? I mean, there was four or five players in front of him, he curls it around the last defender, and the ball curls in at pretty much the only space that Hakri's fingertips can't reach. So, world-class goal, and... Uh, what can I say? Does yeah. it make it uh, less painful losing to something like that? Maybe. But the timing doesn't help, that's for sure. Definitely. Sina? You know? Hello? Sina? Sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't hear what you said. I was like, uh, what did you think? How did you feel afterwards when Messi scored that goal? The 91st minute? Like, how did you feel that moment? Oh, listen. Um, before the game, Probably could have predicted that we might lose by a one goal, but yeah, yeah. the fact that he was he was right at the death, you know, right at the end, yeah. you just you just make the heartbreak even even more. If it was a if it was a goal at the beginning of the game or after forty, if, you know, after forty minutes or even sixty minutes, it would have made it would have been a different story. But when it's in ninety first minute, I mean, it's just yeah, I and mean, it was an incredible goal. Don't get me wrong, but. It was really heartbreaking, and I don't think uh, I want to relive that moment again. You know, a point I want to raise is that I don't know if you guys watch the highlights back or you guys just didn't want to see the goal again, but it felt like a mismatch. You know, I don't know why the hell Reza Gucaneja was on Messi that point. Where was Reza Hariri? Where was where was our center defensive midfielders? And um, that was that was something that surprised me. Do you have you guys have any comments to say on that, Babak? It's, it's a 91st minute of the game, and uh, at that point, uh, the tired minds, tired legs, uh, people are in the motions. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I mean, it's difficult to really uh, criticize anyone at that moment in the game. It's so late into the game, and we're all packed in our defense. Uh, it's picking at, it's grasping at straws, in my opinion. It's difficult to, it's difficult to blame anyone at that point. Yeah. See now? Yeah, I think you're taking away, um, the, taking away the fact that he was a fantastic all the way from Messi back to blame, you know, on which I think, you know, the fact that he was at the back helping out is, um, you know, is appreciable. But I think if if anyone had to get the blame, I think he was nicking on because he was the second man that had yeah. to come out and, and make sure the left side, I mean, uh, yeah, Messi's left foot was covered, but he didn't. He uh, he struggled to uh, to push out early to put pressure. And uh, you know you can't you can't you can't afford to give that much space to Messi. He was a very little space, but listen, we're talking about the best player in the world right exactly. now. Exactly. Um, yeah. Again, you know, as Bob had said, tired, tired uh, bodies, tired minds, and uh, we, we timed the paper in the in the very last second of the game. Exactly. It was bittersweet. It was bittersweet for me that moment. You know, I was deep down. I was like, wow, we gave a great performance. We lost one 0 but I was like, what if, what if just we could have stayed on just two more minutes. And would have easily grasped a legendary, a historic win for our country. But either way, we it was a great performance by our players. I think it was might have been the best, best ever performance they played against a five world class country. And I was very, very, very happy. 
But one thing I do want to add, and now I want to go to another whole topic, is that I'm pretty sure you guys watch Bosnia uh, lose to Nigeria. And I just wanted to think, like, how did you, how do you guys feel now about that? How do you guys feel? We are, obviously we have a chance, but since they lost and they lost, basically they got ripped off as we did. You know, Jago had a goal, and that was clearly onside, but the ref called it offside. So, Bobak, what do you think about that? Uh, to be honest, the game was a 2 a.m. kickoff, and I tried to stay up for it. I yeah. watched bits and pieces, but I was dozing on and off all the time. I saw the goal that Djeko scored. It was a clear goal, not an offside. But overall, I thought Bosnia were very disappointing. Uh, much higher expectations from them back home and even at the World Cup. Everyone expected uh, uh, much more from this Bosnian side. I didn't think that Nigeria had enough to be able to beat Bosnia, but uh, they did yesterday. And now they've been given a, a great opportunity to qualify to the second round, who, where they would definitely lose to whoever they play. I mean, the, the Nigerian team is a very average team, in my opinion, at least in terms of performance, if not players. Yeah. Bosnia, they've, they, they, the, the mental side of things was what I hoped would help us beat Bosnia, and that's exactly what's let them down. After the game against, uh, after we played Nigeria, Bosnian fans and the media, generally, there was a bit of confidence or maybe even arrogance that, you know what, these two teams can't uh, uh, give us a game. We're probably going to go through. We played well against Argentina. We pushed yeah. them till the end. We can get four or six points and qualify for the next round. But they're out. They're the first team out from the group. So I think uh, it, it was very disappointing, and I hope that uh, that carries into their final game against us. Exactly. Sina? I, I was disappointed by the defensive team. I thought they were, they were really poor at the back. I mean, Spanish their captain. When I mean, you expect your captains to be their star, not the star performer, but you know, don't make any rash mistakes. And he did it minute after minute in the first yeah. half. And it was just about time that he got caught out by um, Emenike. And I think, uh, to be honest, defensively they are. I, I don't want to say shocking, but they're not up to it defensively, and they paid the price for it. Of course, the, the, the offside goal. It was. It wasn't even offside. They weren't even on the same line. You. I mean, there was a yard, Jekyll was a yard at least onside, and it should have been a goal. Who knows if that would, that goal would have stood, maybe the outcome would have been uh, much yeah. different. Maybe it would have been the same. You know, maybe Bosnia would have, would have lost the game. But um, I think uh, Bosnia would be, uh, should be very disappointed in themselves. Um, as I said, defensively, I think uh, I think they were really poor. But credit to Nigeria, I mean, they... They really hurt Bosnia down that left hand side of uh, Bosnia defense, and uh, Emenike just kept bullying uh, Spahic uh, throughout the first half. And Emenike as well, yeah. I mean, sorry, uh, Enyama, they have to. I mean, two games in a row, he, he saved that Buchan Nejat header from the corner, which possibly was the best chance of the game. And uh, he saved two or three fantastic uh, chances that uh, Bosnia had. He saved them and uh, he put Nigeria in a, in a great position to, uh, to qualify uh, for the uh, for the second round. But having said that, I expect Argentina to win against Nigeria. I don't think neither of two, those two teams want to uh, finish second to face France in the next round. So I think Argentina will beat Nigeria, and I'm hoping we could um, you know we we play a open game. Not not a really open game, but more offensive game against Bosnia and uh, and get the win. Definitely. Um, one thing I do want to go back to that thing about you said about the left hand side, how Emenike, that's how the goal started. You know, he just outran Safic. But one thing I do want to add to that is that, you know, Susic, the Bosnian manager, dropped Kulisinic. They're basically the predominant left back. You know, he plays for Schalke, he's known as the Beast. He was linked with Man United with all these top clubs, and I was surprised that he was dropped. If he was still against Emenike, I'm pretty sure he would have, that would have not happened. But. I was surprised that tactically and just Susi dropped that player, got to them, and that I think that resulted because you know that was just a simple goal from Odin Wingy on Bekovic, and I think that was just that was just I, I was surprised honestly from the way Bosnia performed their, their their World Cup preparation against Mexico, against Santos, and you know, against all these decent top clubs, they were they were playing so well and they were very very poor, and I was very very surprised with, with that. But one thing I do want to add is that. Now that we know that Bosnia has zero points are out, we have one, Nigeria has four, Argentina has six. So what do you guys think now? Because it has come down to us to beat Bosnia and with goal difference. Bobak, what do you think? I think that's as much as we could have expected before the World Cup. If they told you, beat Bosnia in your last game and you're yeah. going to go through to the second round, we had to take that offer. Uh, the way it's played out... 
I hope that the squad takes the positives from the Argentina game. It doesn't dwell too much on the fact that we conceded a very bitter, bitter defeat. But uh, I think uh, it's not going to be about us as much as it's going to be about Bosnia. It depends on what type of Bosnia team comes out. Are they going to be disheartened and out of it and waiting to get back onto the flight to go back to Sarajevo? Or are they going to be... Uh, looking to prove themselves to the people back home that you know what we're sorry for what happened but we're a decent football we're a decent football uh, nation and we, we we can we can we can win games as well at the World Cup so uh, I think it's going to be um, a tough game uh, lineup wise I think we'd have to play a little bit more offensive I think uh, probably the side that started against uh, uh, Argentina. Maybe if Kirosh is being a little bit bold, he'll play Jahan Bach and Shojai on the wings instead of Haisafi. Yeah. But uh, I'm leaning towards more of a lineup like against Argentina and then see how the game plays out. And if we need to score, then in the last 30 minutes. Luckily for us, Bosnia is an attacking team and they, 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 they ignore defense. So it plays into our game uh, tactics as well. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm still. I still believe that we have a chance, but I really, really worry that we may get a win, and then Nigeria and Argentina ends up either in, uh, <laughs> one nil. We win one nil, and they yeah. lose one nil. It goes into a coin toss or uh, or, or something like that. It's, it's just a nightmare scenario. Yeah, I'm not gonna get into politics about that. But one thing I do, one thing you mentioned about the coin toss is that you know why don't we just play like a sudden death match with Nigeria? I mean that the viewers, I mean I bet you the whole world will be interested in seeing that, and that's something surprising. That if it has to come down to a draw or a coin toss, that'd be very upsetting. But Cena, with any thoughts on what Bobak said? Um, listen, if if we are going to get out, I mean uh, you know if we are to get knocked out. Of the World Cup by goal difference, I think that still is would be regarded as a successful tournament. Yeah. But to get four points and just lose out on a second spot, I mean, uh, yeah, on a second spot by goal difference, I think, I think that's a great achievement. But again, uh, regardless of the Argentina and Nigeria game, we have to go out there and win against Bosnia. And, and I agree with Babak. I think we can't we can't play the same side that did against uh, Nigeria. I think that's that's a little bit too defensive for a game that we we have to win to have any chance of. Uh, you know, going into the second round, so um, I, I picked the same team against Argentina, mm -hmm. but uh, substitutions have to be made a lot earlier in the game. Uh, you know, from uh, 50th to 60th minute, if we are to uh, to get anything out of the game. I mean, by anything, I mean a win. Definitely. So, um, so you guys both prefer that we go with the same lineup, like, with the same lineup we did against Argentina. And now on Wednesday, we'll see how that settles. With but, um, who do you guys think we should look out for from the um, obviously Jago, but he, besides the underdogs for Bosnia, which which under underrated player would you guys think you're running to watch out for besides Jago? Message, message. Message. I'm a huge fan of Mohamed Message. Mm -hmm. I think He's one of those players that have, uh, you know, come to shine in the World Cup and will get a lot of, um, you know, attention from um, top European clubs. Uh, so yeah, he's he's one to look out for. I think uh, the the encounter between him and Andranik would be uh, would be very interesting to see who wins. Uh, you know, who wins that encounter. But um, yeah, I think I'm a huge fan of Bessie. I think he's a awesome. player. Bye bye. Of course, you can't ignore Pjanic as well. Yeah, if, obviously. If Bosnia are to get anything. Out of the game, he would. Uh, I think he would be completely relying on Pjanic to supply uh, supply the um, the chances for Jeko. Bye bye. Yeah, well, you've named the players, but Misimovic as well is a top player, especially from set plays. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what lineup uh, Susic is going to put out. I think it's going to be his strongest lineup, but there's a chance he's going to give some of the younger players an opportunity as well. So uh, probably Nigeria and the pressure from uh, the fact that they have to give Iran a game will probably force Susic's hands. But like I said, it's going to depend on what type of mindset the Bosnian players are going to be in. If, if they're already halfway back home, then we have a very good chance to maybe score a goal or even two. Who knows? But if they're up for it and they want to get a result, I can easily see them running us over as well. Especially with the fact that we're going to play a little bit more attacking yeah. than we did in our first game and maybe even second game. We're going to be more prone to attack quicker. Definitely. And I think, the, honestly, yeah, the, think, yeah, yeah, go on, Tino, sorry. I think Susic will be under a lot of pressure. To, uh, to get something out of the uh, Iran game. So I think he will play his strongest side um, to make sure he doesn't you know, get knocked out of the World Cup with no points whatsoever. 
So um, we can expect. I think we can expect a very attacking Bosnia side, which is you know, which might just be uh, you know good for us because uh, you know we are good at sitting back, absorbing pressure, and hitting teams on the counter. So that might just work out um, you know to our to our favour. Yeah, and one thing, one little small point I want to make about favors is that, you know, the argentina Nigeria match is, happens at the same time we play against Bosnia, and that could be an advantage too, because if they played first, and then we then, afterwards, then we had to play Bosnia, you know, if, and, if, and if, Niger, if Argentina beat them by 2-0 or something, that would, like, you know, make our players more motivated. That could have been a, and another disadvantage would have been if Argentina and Nigeria, if Argentina just beat Nigeria by 1-0. Which I think it's pretty good that they're both happening at the same time, so our players won't really worry about what the result of that score was while they were playing, as opposed to them sitting at the hotel and watching them play. And I think that would be another advantage. But um, one thing I do want to add is that, you know, it, it all comes down to the third game as we expected against Bosnia. But I do do certainly believe that somehow Kairos is going to pull off a miracle like we've, we've done. I'm pretty certain that we could advance this group. Uh, any thoughts, Bobak? <coughs> show I predicted that we're gonna get four points and yeah. we'll probably go through uh, as at this moment uh, I'm hopeful that that can happen I, I would dread the fact that we get four points and we don't go through because Nigeria gets a better goal difference or yeah. a coin toss or even they get a draw but uh, I think we need to focus on our game and just Try to get the three points and see what happens. There's nothing else we can do. We can't. Yeah. We can't control what's outside our uh, the pitch uh, when we, when we play in Salvador on. You know, I think it's on Wednesday if I'm not mistaken. So I'm hopeful. I, I think it's going to be one more ride uh, between life and death for Iranian fans. <laughs> and uh, let's enjoy the game. Let's hope the players play to their best poten potential and don't let themselves down after two impressive performances. And we can get a three points there. Definitely. Um, Sino? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if we get four points, I, I actually think if we get four points and uh, lose out on goal difference, and I think that still should be regarded as an achievement because no, nobody expected us, apart from, you know, us, you know, as Iranian fans, yeah, yeah. nobody expected us to, uh, to get four points. But, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if we are to go out on goal difference, then be it, you know, it's still a it's still a great achievement for us, considering the fact that, you know, as I said before, this is this is possibly not the best team we've ever had to World Cup individually. So yeah, it should be, you know, we should be proud of our team. And uh, the the Argentina and Nigeria game, the result of that game would only come into effect if we beat Bosnia. So we shouldn't really think about that game too much. We should just concentrate on the on the game against the Bosnia and make sure mm -hmm. we pull out a performance. That we wouldn't regret later, you know, and say, what if, you know, what if we would have played this way? What if we would have played that way? Let's go out there and give it a go. You know, play to our best, just like we've had, we've had, in, you know, in the past few games. Give it a hundred percent, and then see where we go from there on. Okay. Guys, I have a question for both of you. Yeah. Uh, what if I told you right now that we do get four points, but we get knocked out with a coin toss? Would you take that, or would you rather we just get a draw? Uh, and then just go out, uh, go out without the pain and the heartache, which will probably, uh, we, which will probably be carried for the rest of our lives as Iranians. To be honest with you, I would rather if we. I mean, I don't want to come down to coin toss because that would hurt me significantly, and that would just make me just feel how you know. Just I'm not getting into politics or anything with that sense, but it's just, it's just a factor that you know. Just we had to lose to Nigeria on a coin toss just to go. To the next round is just just hurtful, you know. After we've never done it in our history, you know, we went to the World Cup for four times and we haven't done that. I would rather us to draw or lose to Bosnia than see that happening. Not honestly, because I think that's like just for my own sake. I think that because I don't want to come out of the World Cup and say, oh wow, we lost. We couldn't go to the next round because of a coin toss because they just bloody decided to just throw a coin, you know. And I think that would hurt. And I just don't want to see that happening. Not honestly, so, you know. No, uh, listen, I don't know how you can say that. Listen, I want to I get a win against Bosnia. If you want to go out on a coin toss, then be it. Listen, it's four points we're talking about. We've never, we've never got anything more than three points out of the World Cup. Four points. No, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question. It's about what you want to put yourself through. It's no, just looking no. back ten years down the line and saying... No, I know. I mean, I would rather us... No, I'm not saying that we shouldn't lose. I'm just saying, like, just a coin toss just pisses me off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah. listen, let's 
first go out there and win the game because it's three points. Three points for a World Cup, you will, you know, it will, it's something to build on for the future. You know, four points, as I said, you know, we've never got four points at the World Cup. We've, we've, you know, the three points out of 98 was the maximum points we've ever got. So, as I said, if we are to go, if we are to go out, mm-hmm. then I don't mind go. I don't mind going to, you know, losing out because of a coin toss. I'd, yeah. I'd rather we lose to that than uh, we, we miss out on a second spot because we drew or lost to Bosnia in a game where Bosnia had nothing to play for and we had everything to play for. Exactly. And one thing I do want to add is that now as a tournament, I bet you a lot of big clubs or just some decent second division because we'll definitely come after our own players, you know, try to recruit them, Jennifer Donald come, and that would be a beneficial thing for our own players and as our country to see our players going to Europe or elsewhere. Just And um, as that, any other points? Was any, would you guys any have any any other concluding factors you guys want to add that we haven't discussed? I think, actually, to your last point about the players, I don't think it's likely to happen because we've got too many players who are on the wrong side of 30. Yeah. As good as Saudi and Hosseini and Montezli have been, no one, no club in Europe is going to come and pay money for a player who's never played in Europe and is 31 or 32 years old. And, and Ranik Temurian as well. He may have yeah. an outside chance for a smaller team. He's 31, he's played in Europe before, which could play to his advantage. Nekunam is too old. Then you have Masoud. It's possible that he'll continue in Europe. You have Dejaga, who's probably not going to play in the championship next season. Gucci, probably possibly a chance. Puladi, maybe, at the age of 27. The goalkeeper, yeah. Hagigi. But generally speaking, more uh, the, the bigger uh, bigger uh, portion of our team is on the wrong side of 30, and I yeah. don't think they're going to be playing in Europe. But maybe it'll serve as a motivation for the younger players. Exactly. They say, hey, we should move abroad. Give her, look at Aliza Jahan Bash. Look at the player he's become in just one season of playing in Europe. He's, exactly. he's a different player. I mean, I watched a bit of him in Iran before. He's not the same player. He, he, his movement, his uh, his discipline, mentally, and uh, his understanding of the game, it's just uh, it's un- incomparable to the players that play in Iran. And that's just through one season playing in the right club in the right country. And Mahdavik needs to get a lot of credit for that because he convinced him to go to NEC in Holland. Which yeah, I, I, I heard that this yeah. Year, actually. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mahdavik was one of our pioneers, Ali Dai, exactly. uh, even Vahid Hashemi. These are players who moved abroad at a younger yeah. age and they set the path for the future for other players. And they went not for the money, they went for the love of the game and they really put a lot, they, they really built the future for the rest of these uh, generations of football players. Exactly. Sina? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Bob accepted there wouldn't be anyone from the starting lineup to get into Europe and I think that's a bit of an if there is any negative from this uh, this tournament from our point of view then it would be the fact that our young our best young players have been on the bench and haven't really uh, you know made an appearance yeah. whether it's Ansari Fad, Jahan Bash or Bakhti or Rahmani or even Reza Hadji you know they've not really made a huge appearance in the World Cup but I still expect him uh, to get a lot of attention and even though yes you know this, the main players wouldn't really go to Europe because of their age, but I still think if we are to perform, you know, if we are, to, you know, which we have done, we perform well in the World Cup. It will attract a lot of scouts to come into Iran and watch the players. Exactly. So I think that's uh, that's a, that's a really good positive point yeah, because then our players player. would get noticed. That you know, our players would get noticed, and uh, yeah, I think as I said, you know, the players that you would expect to go to move into Europe haven't uh, haven't really uh, played yet. Exactly. So that's it, guys. I really, really uh, appreciate you guys doing this with me and for our viewers. Uh, is there anything else you'd you guys like to add? Mm, let's, just, let's just hope and pray and believe that we have a chance on, yeah. against Bosnia. And let's hope we have another show after the game, pre, re, pre, uh, reviewing our third game and previewing the second round clash against what could be France. Exactly. Sina? Yes. You know, I've. I've I agree with what Bob said. I think uh, let's hope that we, you know, we, you know, we'll be talking to each other in a few days' time uh, yeah. on the back of a win against Bosnia and another, another great performance by our boys. So uh, yeah, I mean, we're all hoping for that. Anyways. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys for doing this. Uh, we'll speak to you guys. Everybody, we'll do this again for sure. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.